It's time now for the big question in which we speak to the biggest names in the world of politics, entertainment and sports. And Kelly Maloney is one of the giants in the world of boxing, a top boxing manager and promoter. Kelly managed Lennox Lewis to the undisputed heavyweight championship of the world, as well as many other boxing stars. She ran for the London mayoral election in 2004 as the UKIP candidate, a fixture in the world of professional sport and reality TV. She has starred in Celebrity Mastermind, Celebrity Big Brother and numerous other TV hits. It gives me huge pleasure to welcome Kelly Maloney to GB News. Hi, Kelly. Hello, Mark. How are you? I'm really well. It's been too long. Great to, great to see you again. Unfortunately, it's virtual. Maybe next time in the studio. How was lockdown for you? Um, it was OK. I mean, I, I, I spent most of the lockdown at my house in Portugal. Um, uh, where I keep a number of animals. I have a small freehold here. And um, I really enjoyed it. I'm, I am quite a person that's quite good with my own company. So mm. it, to be honest, it didn't really affect me as much as it affected people back in the UK or others because, you know, I had the animals where I live. I don't have any neighbours and I was able to go out for long walks and things like that. And, and I just think the Portuguese dealt with it a lot better than... Brits, because when I've been home to visit my mum and the family, I'm just surprised the way some of the British people are dealing with it and the ignorance of it. Um, you know, to me, our safety is priority. You know, the safety of hu the human race is priority. And, and I've known people who have lost family members because of COVID. And until you actually lose someone, I don't think you realise how serious it is. You know, just recently, a very good friend of mine found her, her 88-year-old mother um, dead um, through COVID. And, you know, it, it's just she's been unable to deal with it and cope with it at the moment. And I, I can really feel for that person. Yeah, that's, uh, of course, absolutely devastating. And I did hear that the Portuguese authorities were rather more liberal than the British authorities, allowing people to judge the risk um, by their own determination rather than dictating to everybody? Well, no, we were, in the height of it, we had to wear masks everywhere. We wasn't, we wasn't allowed to leave our districts over the weekends because obviously the Portuguese families gather together quite a lot and they were trying to stop uh, the families getting together. But we are a lot more liberal now and um, you know, I think we've got it under control quite well here. Our restaurants have reopened up. Um, the bars have reopened up and obviously tourism is back allowed in the country. But they, you know, when you arrive at the airport, they check all your paperwork and everything else. Where when I've come back to the UK, my paperwork has never been checked. I've just been asked, um, have, I, have I been double vaccinated? Which obviously I have. Yeah. But the other paperwork, they've never really inquired about. Yeah, no, uh, it, uh, it is very concerning, isn't it? Well, let's talk about you and your amazing career. You are, of course, a legendary boxing manager and promoter, a, co a coach yeah. and promoter, but you were a boxer yourself. So how did you get into boxing? Can you remember how old you were when you started? I was about 12 years old. I was at my secondary school. I was getting bullied a lot and I got into lots of fights. And the PE teacher just said to me, Maloney, if you want to fight, that's the place to fight. And he took me down the gym and he just threw boxing gloves at me. And for some unknown reason... I really enjoyed the sport. I don't know if it's because it was an individual sport where you you were responsible for your sort of... You had trainers, obviously, and they trained you, but technically you you are in that ring on your own. Once the bell goes, there is no one in there with you. You're up there on your own, and if you cheat in your training or you don't prepare right, you're going to get beat and you're going to get hurt, and I, 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 maybe that's what I enjoyed. But being only five foot two and dripping less than eight stone dripping wet. There was no future for me in the professional boxing ranks. And I, I took up training. I, I went to an amateur club in South London, which was formed by my dad and some friends to keep, keep us all off the streets um, in the Elephant and Castle. And um, I became a trainer there. And it, just from there, it just progressed. And eventually, I went into the boxing world. I started working with Kieran Murphy and Frank Warren with a company called Pirate Promotions. And I, I, to me, I still think, how did it ever happen? How did I manage to sign Lennox Lewis? How did I manage to be, 
become the first Brit to manage an undisputed heavyweight champion in the world. And I still am the only British manager to manage an undisputed heavyweight champion in the world. You know, um, at the moment, unfortunately, AJ, who's lost all his titles, um, Tyson Fury doesn't hold all the titles, but he is the best heavyweight out there at the moment. And I believe that he could be the next Brit to become undisputed if he gets the opportunity. And do you think you were a better promoter or a better trainer? Um, I was. I don't know. I. It's hard to say. I mean, I, you know, when, it, even as a when you were looking after Lennox, did you did you have input on his training as well as his sort of management and promotion? Not, not really. I, you know, I would organise the training camps and set them up, and I would sit with the trainers and we would chat and talk. No, the credit for Lennox's training goes to Emmanuel Stewart and Harold Knight, Courtney Shan and Joe Dunbar. I mean, they work wonders, but we always sat and we always talked and, you know, I just set up the training camp. Um, I was in training camp all the time. I arranged for sparring partners and I got the videos they wanted and um, just took care of all the press and everything like that. But I learned a lot watching the great Emmanuel Stewart and watching Harold Knight, who was a young trainer at the time, Courtney Shan and um, Lennox's sports physiologist, Joe Dunbar, who I still work with at the moment. When, um, if I need any advice on sport. Well, I think that's fantastic. We've got lots of questions coming in, Kelly. This one is from Jeff. Jeff, thank you so much for getting in touch. And it reads as follows. Is Lennox the most underrated boxer of all time? Um, I wouldn't say he's underrated. I think he's one of the best boxers. You know, I would put Lennox in the top five of heavyweights throughout the century um, because... The two issues that lit Lennox down were the two defeats, which he didn't prepare properly for, but he learned his lesson and prepared properly in the rematches, and we saw he won the rematches quite convincingly. Um, so I, I, I put Lennox in the top five of all-time heavyweights. Um, how about this one from Stuart on email? And Stuart has contacted the, pro contact the programme, marketgbnews.uk. What is the greatest fight side for what's the greatest fight you've been in ringside I there, there's there's so many um and it, some might, might not believe they wasn't all Lennox Lewis I you know I met I managed and guided Paul Ingalls's career the Yorkshire Hunter to the IBF world title fight but he had a world title fight with Prince Nazim Hamid in in Manchester promoted by um Barry Hearns and I think that was one of the best fights I'd ever been involved in and if I had to pick a Lennox Lewis fight, I would go with Shannon Briggs and Lennox Lewis in Atlantic City and Scott Harrison's fight with um, with the Mexican, um, I forgot his name, Ma um, Manuel Medina. It was, you know, yeah. there, there's some great fights and even just some British type. Jamie Moore and Matthew Macklin probably was one of the best British fights that I ever promoted. It was one of the... You know, I actually watched it the other day on YouTube. I don't know why. It kept, it popped up on social media. And I, and, I, and I thought, how did them two ever fight like that? For the, you know, and what they gave, them. you know, I was always taught because, I, you know, I served an apprenticeship under the great Mickey Duff as well. And I was always taught that a, a champion will want to be carried out on his shield, which I'm not sure is the right attitude to have, but these two guys, they gave everything and they both left the ring absolutely exhausted. Thankfully, Jamie Moore won, won the fight, but it went down as one of the best fights I've ever been involved in in a British ring. One of the great fights that you've had was the fight for your own identity, Kelly, and um, we've spoken on many occasions in the past. Uh, you were born Frank and you became known as Kelly and you transitioned in 2014, uh, did you know from day one that you were a little girl, not a little boy? Uh, no, from about the age of three, I knew I felt very different to my brothers, but obviously being born to um, a working class Irish Catholic family and all boys, you know, I was brought up in that environment and I never wanted to feel different or be left out. So I, you know, I, I became very competitive, um, probably very arrogant as I grew up and became a boxing promoter, made quite a lot of mistakes. Um, 
And it wasn't until I read a, I read a story about uh, April Ashley, who is a very big icon in the trans community. And I actually think I owe my life to her. And I, I, I read this story. I was about 12, 13. It was in the Sunday People. And I, everything I read, I could relate to. But I, I saw how the papers totally destroyed her. And that day I said to myself, I will never, ever tell anyone how I feel or who I am. I will be Frank Maloney for the rest of my life. But, mm. you know, it, it, it never worked. I, I couldn't because I, I attempted suicide a couple of times through depression, through um, other things. And eventually I had the courage to really look in the mirror and, and face my true self and, and fully transition to the person I am today a much happier person, a much more contented person. And if I'm honest, I don't miss my previous life, but I will never deny my previous life because I can run from my previous life, but I can't hide from it. So it's always going to be there. And I think that understanding of an awareness around people transitioning uh, was, was sort of less common, wasn't it? When it happened for you. And it's one of the big hot topics of the day now in 2021, you made that journey around six or seven years ago, particularly challenging, not just because it wasn't a fully understood um, journey to be on, but of course you did it in the world of boxing, quite a macho world, male dominated. Well, I'd done it because I had to do it. Um, You know, people say to me I was brave. I wasn't brave. You know, if I hadn't done it, I wouldn't be sitting here today doing chatting with you, Mark, you know, and, you know, I've been interviewed by you a number of times on radio, on your radio station before you joined GBM. And, you know, I've always found you to be fair. I, I think there's a very big misunderstanding of the trans community and there's a fear out there. And, you know, it's a fear on both sides. I feared how I would be received by the British public, how I would be received by everybody, my family, my friends, my career. and. You know, and that's and that's a big stop. And I know people fear some trans people. They don't understand it. And they have the right not to understand it. And they have the right not to want to accept it. But what they don't have the right to do is deny anybody's existence because we are all human beings. Forget the labels. Forget the letters of the alphabet. We are, first and last, all human beings. And we will all leave this world the same way in that wooden box, no matter if I'm a trans woman, a trans man, non-binary, um, heterosexual. We're all going in. That, we're all going. In, we're, not, we're not all going in the box together, but we're all going in the same box, and we will all leave this world the same way. Well, I agree with you that uh, very passionately, and that was the theme of my monologue earlier this evening in relation to skin colour. Uh, which is that we are all human beings and it's important that that unites us rather than divides us. I share that sentiment uh, hugely. And are you still on good terms with your children since that big change? And what about Tracy, uh, the lady you were married to when it all happened, if, my, if I may ask? Yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah no, we, we talk. My youngest daughter's on her way out to see me because I am in the Algarve still at the moment. Um, I come back in a couple of weeks back to the UK, but I'm, my, my young daughter's coming out tomorrow. I'll pick her up at the airport. My oldest daughter has moved to the Algarve and bought a business here. So, yeah, and my family have been very supportive and very closely knitted around me. And in fairness, they've defended me against a lot of attacks, you know, on social media. So I, I, I am very lucky that my family have been so supportive. And, and you know, I like to think it's the way we, we brought them up. Uh, Tracy and myself and obviously Emma's for Jackie my first my first wife and I'm also very friendly with her so yeah I am you know I'm very lucky one of my bro- my brothers had a lot of trouble dealing with it but thankfully my middle brother who I worked with as well in the boxing world you know we have become great friends again and we talk on a regular basis and when I go home we spend time together again and you know it's really nice that the family of are totally united around me. Do you feel that you're a better parent now? Uh, I'm, I'm a much better parent, yes. <laughs> I'm actually a much better human being. I'm not arrogant. I'm not making the mistakes I made. You know, I made some terrible mistakes. One of those mistakes was, you know, I joined the UKIP party. Um, I didn't really understand politics at the time. 
I, as, I, as you said earlier, I ran for the mayor of London. I made some very derogatory comments to certain communities. Um, and I wish I hadn't done that, but I've done that and I had to live with them comments. And, um, you know, they're always brought up in, in, in certain situations. People like to bring them up, you know, but I'm happy to face them because, you know, when I made them, I wasn't in the right place. And I'm not using that as an excuse, but they were made and they're, they're you know, I, I, I grew up in a world where they, I was always told, um, press was, there's no such thing as bad press because the next day it's chip paper. But unfortunately, there's now the internet and the social media. So whatever you say, as cricketers are now finding out and footballers, it lasts for, and politicians, it lasts forever. So you, you you can't hide from the comments that you make. So I believe the best thing is to face them. And if you're genuine and sincere about apologies, people will see that and understand that and eventually they will forgive you. Uh, Kelly, I want to uh, get on to reality TV and what you're up to now. Still in the world of boxing, I'm delighted to hear. Um, can we just cover a couple of issues uh, within the trans debate? I'd love to know your honest views. Uh, what are your thoughts about trans women participating in male sport? We saw Laurel Hubbard uh, participating in a weightlifting category at the Olympics in New Zealand. What's your view on that? My view is that sport should be for all and sport should be a level playing field. There are certain sports where men and women can compete against each other. I am not an expert on the trans community, on the sporting world, so I really can't come fully comment on that. And I, do, I don't avoid or sit on the fence, but I believe until there is proper medical evidence, not people just saying this and other people saying this, until we actually take trans people at all different stages of transitioning, and measure their bone structure, their physiology, everything against female athletes of the same age and the same stage of life, we will never know. And, you know, no one, really, the, the government should do this, pay for this to be done, and it would end all arguments. But you cannot blame trans women for wanting to compete in women's sport or taking part because they are breaking no rules. They are following the rules that are laid down by the Olympic Committee or the governing bodies of the sport. So the argument is not with us, our community, and we shouldn't be kicked around like football. Your argument is with the governing bodies. So take your argument up with them and ask them to do the, the proper medical research that should be done. That's, that's my belief and that's it. A really fair answer. Well, look, the clock's against us. Just a few seconds to go. If we go rapid fire through some questions, uh, JA on Twitter asks, do you think Lennox Lewis should have gone through higher career undefeated? Uh, yes, I do. As I said earlier when you chatted to me about it, he made two mistakes. He underestimated the opponents and didn't prepare properly for them. And he paid that penalty. Will Millwall make the playoffs this season? Asks Mick on Twitter. <laughs> do you know what? I'm very lucky. I can watch every Millwall game here in Portugal. Um, and sometimes I'm so excited watching them. And other times I think, no, they're so bad. Um, I don't know. I think Gary Rowlitz has to change the way he plays. He's too defensive-minded. Millwall are an attacking side and a passionate side. And sometimes I think we lack the passion that I used to know it. But then, I, but fingers crossed they make the playoffs. I, if I, they do, I will be first at Wembley. It's, it's an amazing club with a great, great history, I've got to say. So I do, I do hope that uh, they can make the playoffs. Um, really briefly, uh, let's just touch on it. The Big Brother house, you were in there. I think it was Series 14. Did you enjoy it? Tell me about life in the kind of goldfish bowl of celebrity. Um, no, I didn't really enjoy it. Um, I went in very early. It was only three weeks after my story broke. I mentally wasn't strong enough when I went in there. And a lot of the old Frank came back out. But I came out there stronger, thanks to certain people in the house, like uh, D, who I'm still great friends with, um, who George. That? D? Sorry, who was that D? D, White D from Benefit oh, Street. Of course, White D from, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, um, um, George from Gogglebox, and um, Claire, the actress from Coronation Street, that unfortunately had to leave that was ill, and Adele from um, the Irish uh, Bewitched the Music Group. They were fantastic and they really helped me. And I, I went in there a wreck, 
I actually came out there stronger. So in a way, I said I, I was in rehabilitation. And of course, that was White D. I remember interviewing her a, a while back. She was a star, of course, of My Benefits Street on Channel 4. And the last question, what was your specialist subject on Mastermind, Kelly? Boxing. <laughs> Obviously. And let me guess, all right answers. Do you know what? I lost it by one point and I got one question wrong in the boxing. I just... You don't realise when them lights are on, you how you freeze. I can. That's why I don't do too many quiz shows. And you, you, um, you know the answer, but the lights are on you and you panic. Yeah. And the answer should have been Frank Bruno. And I said John L. Gardner. And when I said it, when it came out of my mouth, I went, "Oh." Well, we've both I've both been wrong. on that show, and I know how terrifying the spotlight is, and John Humphreys as well. But you've been an absolute delight, Kelly. Thank you so much for joining us. I wish you well, and uh, I hope you have fun with your daughter when she uh, flies over to see you in Portugal. I'm and, sure. Uh, come and see us. Do come and see us when you're back in the UK. The wonderful Kelly Maloney. What a story. There you go. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favourite shows and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.